Dr. Craig, you've had an opportunity to be on the TV program Closer to Truth with Robert Kuhn. A lot of good people on that. Yes, um, indeed. Very uh, eminent cosmologists and philosophers are on that program. He interviewed Sean Carroll as well, and we wanted to interact with various portions of that. It's a long interview, but we looked at a few things of interest and wanted to comment on that. Robert Kuhn really pressed Sean on did the universe have a beginning? And Carol's answer was, well, we don't know. Right. He says, we don't know if the universe had a beginning. And his skepticism is based upon the fact that we don't have a quantum theory of gravity yet to describe the earliest uh, split second of the existence of the universe. And the hope here, I think, on his part is that such a theory of gravity might enable us to save the past eternality of the universe. All the evidence that we do have points to a beginning of the universe, but the hope is that if you can find this quantum theory of gravity, they, that might serve to avert it. Now, I think that there's um, an epistemological issue, Kevin, that is in play here when he says, we don't know. When he uses the word know, he's using this in a very strong sense to say we're not certain. We're not scientifically certain. But that does nothing to negate the fact that the evidence makes it highly probable that the universe did have a beginning. You don't need to have certainty about something in order to say where the evidence points and which conclusion is probably true. Even Lawrence Krauss, you may remember, in our dialogues in Australia, said that if he had to decide, he said the universe probably did begin to exist, even given quantum theories of gravity. So our uncertainty about how to describe the first split second of the origin of the universe um, doesn't necessarily negate the fact that the universe uh, is finite in the past. Uh, I think even if we don't know that with certainty, nevertheless we have good reason to think that the universe is finite in the past, even given a quantum theory of gravity. Um, Alex Vilenkin, who is a very prominent cosmologist at Tufts University, um, in 2012 gave a lecture at a conference for Stephen Hawking's 70th birthday in Cambridge University, where he surveys all of the attempts to avoid the beginning of the universe, which the evidence seems to predict. And what he shows is that none of these scenarios is able to actually avoid the beginning of the universe. The evidence indicates that classical time and space, that is to say, time and space not taking into account quantum effects, have a beginning, that they go, it goes back to a boundary point. Now, either there was something on the other side of that boundary or not. If not, then that big boundary just was the beginning of the universe. If there was something on the other side of that boundary, then that, Vilenkin says, was the beginning of the universe. It's not something that can be extended infinitely into the past. On one level, there isn't any past, because time begins with that classical boundary. Now, in a, in a metaphysical sense, if you say, well, there still is before and after. This regime, after all, was before the classical regime. If there's some sort of metaphysical sense in which there is time, well, the fact is that a quantum state is metastable. That is to say, it cannot endure for infinite time just doing nothing, and then suddenly 14 billion years ago transition to this classical space-time. It would have done that from eternity past or not at all. So even given this prior quantum gravity regime, which Vilenkin himself provides models for, there's no evidence whatsoever that this could be extended infinitely into the past. In fact, I think the evidence is quite against it. And this is an issue which comes up in the debate with Sean Carroll 
that I had uh, at the Greer Herd Farm in New Orleans last year on um, the existence of God and the evidence of current cosmology. And I do not recall that he responded to this point specifically uh, in any of his responses uh, or post-debate uh, comments that such a quantum state cannot endure for infinite time prior to transitioning to classical space-time. So you don't need to have a quantum physical description of the first split second of the origin of the universe in order to predict um, reliably that the universe began to exist. Bill, I don't know if it's self-imposed or if it's used as kind of, of a repellent, perhaps against God, which it often is, when a scientist says, we don't know. It's like the scientist is expected to say, well, but we don't know. You know, we don't know yet. And so you're, you're certainly showing that there's certainty versus probability. Right, and I and think that, that's the key point, Kevin. Yeah. Even if we don't know in the sense of scientific certainty in the way that we know that the heart pumps blood through the human body, nevertheless, I think the evidence makes it very probable, yeah. or more probable than not, that the universe did begin to exist. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's a little bit of a rant of mine because I get tired of people throwing that at me as a conversation stopper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but really we don't know. Mm -hmm. and at that point you need to go through certainty and versus probability and so on. Uh, second, he's asked, if the universe is finite, why does it look the way it does? Yes, well, he discusses in one of these clips the alternatives of the universe being infinite in time and infinite in space or uh, infinite in time but finite in space or finite in time and finite in space. And he dislikes the notion of the universe being finite in time and space because he, then he says we don't have any explanation for why the universe looks so weird. Now, I think, Kevin, that that is an oblique reference to the fine-tuning of the universe. Why do the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe fall into this extraordinarily narrow range of life-permitting values, rather than into the much more probable range of life-prohibiting values? And what you can say, if you're a, um, an advocate of an infinite universe, well, in a universe that is infinite in time or space, there are infinite probabilistic resources, and there are somewhere every possibility will be actualized, and so you solve the problem just by postulating infinity. But if you have finite time and space, then you're left with the problem. How do you explain the fine-tuning? because you cannot appeal any longer to infinite probabilistic resources in time or space in order to get rid of the problem. Um, well, that's just a philosophical prejudice against design as a best explanation for the fine-tuning of the universe. For the theist, the finitude of the universe in time and space is no problem because the fine-tuning points to the existence of a cosmic designer. So in this sense, the theist can be more open to follow the evidence where it leads. If the evidence does suggest a universe finite in uh, time uh, or space, we can follow the evidence where it leads uh, and be open to it because we don't have a prejudice or an a priori assumption against the idea of a cosmic designer. They mentioned many models which don't have a beginning. There, there are a few of them out there. Right. Carroll likes to do this. He did this in the debate that we had in New Orleans where he puts up a PowerPoint slide with something like 17 different models of the universe uh, that don't involve a beginning. What he doesn't do, though, is explore the tenability of any of these models and show that they provide a mathematically consistent, empirically tenable, much less probably true, 
model of the actual universe. Models come cheap. <laughs> uh, one cosmologist once remarked to me that developing different models of the universe is almost like entertainment for the professional uh, cosmologist. You can develop any kind of model that you want, but what the challenge is to show that this model provides an empirically tenable and plausible model of the actual universe that we observe. And when you look at them more closely, for example, as my colleague Jim Sinclair did in our article in the Blackwell Companion, um, in which 10 out of the 17 that Carol had on that PowerPoint slide are already discussed and shown to be untenable, or as Vilenkin uh, did in his 2012 lecture, you find out that none of these scenarios provide a plausible, empirically tenable, mathematically consistent model for a universe without a beginning. So sure, there are lots of models of the universe not involving a beginning, but that doesn't even uh, begin <laughs> to settle the issue as to whether or not our actual universe yeah. is correctly modeled by one of these. I've often heard that uh, a good model will make predictions, things that we, what, expect to discover? Yes, so that the model would be testable. Okay. And insofar as these models have been testable, the beginningless ones have failed to meet the test. Um, by contrast, as he mentioned, say the Hartle-Hawking model, Stephen Hawking's no boundary proposal, this is a universe which, uh, though it incorporates a quantum theory of gravity at the beginning, or Vilenkin's own quantum gravity model, which incorporates quantum gravity at the beginning, these models still have a beginning, and the universe comes into existence on these models and are not preceded by anything. Um, so these are models that have a beginning of the universe. They are not infinite in the past, even though these are quantum gravity models. And these are still tenable models. They're still on the table. Uh, in contrast to the beginningless cosmologies, which insofar as they are testable, um, are ruled out. Sean Carroll says that his, his favorite model is the empty space universe. Uh, Am I categorizing that right? Yes, this is the way he describes it in the interview with Robert Kuhn. And what he's talking about here is his own model of the universe that he developed um, with a, a graduate assistant called the Carol Chen model. What isn't clear from the interview is that this empty space is not the space in which we live. Remember, that space is shrinking. Uh, as you go back to the Big Bang, that space is approaching a state of infinite density and collapse. So that space is not eternal and empty. He is talking about a kind of mother universe, which is this empty space in which these baby universes are birthed, as in the womb of this mother universe. And our universe is one of these little baby universes uh, that are conceived within the womb of this wider mother universe, which is empty space. And he claims that this mother universe is eternal in the past, even though our baby universe in which we live is not eternal in the past. Well, this involves all sorts of problems, such as I laid out in the debate um, with Carol. One in particular that's interesting is if this model is interpreted to involve a reversal of the arrow of time at some point in the past, then that means that the, so to speak, the, the first half of the model is in no sense prior to our half of the model. That, that mirror image universe is not earlier than our universe. So in no sense does it represent an infinite past. In fact, what you've got really is two universes with a common beginning. It's kind of like a forked universe where you have two universes emerging from a common beginning, which is the point of um, least entropy. So that even his own model 
if it were empirically tenable, um, wouldn't involve an eternal universe because that mirror universe is not in any sense temporally prior to the universe in which, we, uh, or the, the mother universe which gives rise to our baby universe. Robert asked him, he said, do you mean just regular space, good old fashioned space? He goes, yeah, empty space. Well, yeah. except it's not the space in which we live. Okay, yeah. It, it, is, it is this wider space in which then multiple many universes are born. It is a multiverse model. And he tries to avoid the beginning of the universe by saying that even though our mini universe had a beginning, this mother universe is an eternal, empty space. But then that involves the problems that I just mentioned. Yeah. And if I'm understanding Sean Carroll correctly, he he seems to make uh, a connection with the fact that this universe is heading toward empty space. That's right. He thinks that as this universe expands and matter becomes so diffuse that eventually our universe will become one of these empty spaces and then it will give rise to its own babies so that you have a self-perpetuating multiverse where each one will produce further babies and this will go on forever. But the question is, can it have gone on forever from eternity past? And even his own model doesn't involve an eternal past because, to repeat myself, that mirror universe on the other side of the low entropy state is in no sense our past. Robert asked him at the end, just want to ask you again, Sean, <laughs> did the universe have a beginning? And Sean's answer is? More or less he says, this is my preference that the universe does not have, a, pardon me, let me say it again. His answer is to say he prefers having a universe that is infinite in time and space. He prefers a universe that has no beginning. The problem is there just isn't any evidence. I'd prefer to be a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's my there, there just isn't any evidence to support the fact that you're a millionaire yeah. <laughs> or that the universe is beginningless.